Welcome to Pinpointing the Top Questions and Considerations about Biosimilars. I'm Dr. Len Calabrese. I'm a professor of medicine at the Cleveland Clinic Lerner College of Medicine. And joining me today will be... John Tesser. Hello, everybody. I have an appointment at the Midwestern University College of Medicine in Glendale, Arizona, and I'm with Arizona Arthritis and Rheumatology Associates in the greater Phoenix area. Today, we're going to usher you through this maze of biosimilars. We have four learning objectives. First, we're going to define biosimilars, the extrapolation of indications and interchangeability. These are very important terms. Secondly, we'll explain the similarities and differences between biosimilars and originators and add some more terminology. Thirdly, we'll evaluate key aspects of the FDA guidance document that really ushers biosimilars through approval. And lastly, we'll try to do this in a very practical way, apply this foundational knowledge so you can use it in the practice of rheumatology. This next slide shows a list of the approved biosimilars in the U.S., and there's no doubt that it's growing. Now, most of you that are following along with us today recognize that while these agents are approved, not all are available, and uh, we'll get into some of the reasons of this as we go along. Let's commence with a quick review of some core concepts. All of you joining us today are very familiar with the concepts of biologics. These are drug products from recombinant uh, DNA technology. And by actual definition, uh, they cannot be made generic. They cannot be made a carbon copy. It's because of the complexity of these molecules. The antibodies are, are huge with primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structural relationships, post-translational modifications. And because these drugs have been around for years, and actually uh, over decades, they have varied over time as there have been refinements in the production process. A quick review of core concepts tells us that a biosimilar is a biologic product highly similar, and I emphasize this highly similar, this is a term that we will use time and time again, to a U.S. licensed reference biologic product for which there are no clinical meaningful differences. This is the crux of the definition. It cannot be different to convey a different signal in either efficacy uh, or toxicity. And that takes us to the next core concept. The comparability exercise used to demonstrate that biosimilars are highly similar to a reference agent is scientific, robust, and regulated. Now, that's a tall statement, and we'll kind of break this down uh, as we go through as to what the level of evidence is required uh, to make that statement. So let's talk about a case, and this is one of the um, very interesting aspects of this deck. This is the first uh, exercise that I've seen where there's been an attempt to put case examples in this topic of biosimilars. This is a 50-year-old male with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, it's uh, ACPA positive. It's five years in duration. And currently, uh, he is on methotrexate at a healthy dose of 20 to 1.5 milligrams a week orally. Also on prednisone, 5 milligrams, and hydroxychloroquine, 200 milligrams twice a day. But his disease is not well controlled. He has uh, 12 tender and 3 swollen joints. He has a DOS of 3.8, which we recognize to be ongoing moderate disease activity. So it's deemed that he's a candidate for a biologic agent per ACR 2015 revised guidelines. And you suggest uh, several biologic options to this patient. And based on uh, shared uh, and informed decision-making, back-and-forth conversation with the patient, you both agree to start at alimumab at 40 milligrams subcutaneous every other week. In considering the treatment with this molecule, there actually are several options. There's the innovator molecule, Humira, which we're all fairly con uh, familiar with since it's released in 2003 on the market. But there are now approved several other agents, Amgevita, which is adalimumab ATTO, and Siltezo, which is adalimumab ADBM. Now, the suffixes on the scientific name of the molecule are, in this case, nonsense suffixes. And there's a reason for that, because if you got a little bit um, overwhelmed by that first table of all the 
biosimilars that had been approved, you would have noticed perhaps that the first one had a, a suffix on it that refreshed the memory to uh, the company that made it, Sandoz, SNDZ, but these do not refer to the production company, and that's pretty much on purpose. Now, the dose for all three products is 40 milligrams every other week. And let's review the FDA process for this. And the question I think would come up in all of our minds is, is the process by which the FDA has analyzed all the data submitted to it on any given biosimilar, is that really rigorous? Can we really have confidence in this? And that's what we're going to be exploring here. So the next slide, we'll begin this process. So on the left-hand side of this uh, table, if you will, we have generics, which are, as Len mentioned, exact copies. They're small molecules. They're made in test tubes. There's uh, an approval process. You can see it's uh, on the left-hand side, 505B1 and B2. And uh, they have to go through rigorous um, process by the FDA to get approved uh, in that fashion. But when the patent is up on the originator small molecule, then there is the ability through a 505J abbreviated drug application for a generic molecule, again, to be manufactured in a test tube that is identical to the original molecule. And there's no safety or efficacy data required because it's understood that it's identical in structure, character. Only some bioequivalence um, studies have to be done. And, of course, this would be a very much easier pathway for any molecule to get approved by the FDA. But when we talk about biosimilars on the right-hand side here, um, as Len mentioned, we appreciate these are highly similar. So the original biologic molecule has to go through a 351A a license application. There has to be a, a full report on the safety and efficacy and the predominance um, evidence for approving a biologic has to be on the phase three clinical studies. We all appreciate that. Biosimilars is the opposite. The predominant amount of evidence has to be in the structural analytical evidence about the molecule and the biosimilarity of the molecule. And the amount of clinical evidence actually winds up being rather small as far as a requirement for this to be approved. And this is done on purpose because the idea is to get biosimilars to market if they're highly similar to the originator in a more efficient, less costly fashion. And you see that the, um, the process is denoted by a 351A application. So with that being said, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see that on the right-hand side, all of the data has to show that there's an absence of clinically meaningful differences of the biosimilar to the originator biologic. And at the very bottom, there is a term introduced here called interchangeability. And this is pointing out that that is a different concept, which is a more stringent concept, an approval for interchangeability um, has a separate pathway, which hasn't actually been finalized by the FDA. It's been proposed, and it's a higher standard, and we'll talk about that. So the stepwise approach to produce the totality of evidence in a, to evaluating a biosimilar uh, starts on the left-hand bottom of the slide. It has to go through analytical studies, as Len mentioned, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary, structural studies have to be done to demonstrate the structural similarity to the originator, and then it has to go into animal studies, um, looking at all kinds of tox uh, uh, studies and uh, biosimilarity issues there. And then it can go into human studies with clinical PK and PD, um, and then clinical immunogenicity assessments, highly important when we're talking about injecting proteins into people because of the potential for anti-drug and anti-neutralizing anti-drug antibodies, and then there can be some additional clinical studies. Um, usually we're looking for phase three studies. Interestingly enough, the FDA in its document states that they can, if they uh, see that there's no need to demand clinical studies in any individual case where they're approving a biosimilar. So the idea is that the biosimilar has to be demonstrated to be highly similar to the uh, reference product and uh, doesn't have to independently establish safety and efficacy. And so that's why this pyramid is straight up, 
because the analytical foundation for all of the um, data to be amounted to present to the FDA is the foundation of the pyramid. And then you see the non-clinical and then the clinical pharmacology, and then at the very top, the clinical studies. And you see on the left, it's highly similar uh, concept based on the analytics and the clinical pharmacology, and that there's not no clinically meaningful differences based on targeted clinical trials in a sensitive population, and that has to be determined and agreed upon between the manufacturer and the FDA. When we look at original biologic molecules, take this pyramid, turn it upside down, and you'll see that the top of that is the uh, clinical phase three program, which uh, constitutes the bulk of the evidence to win approval. All right, so let's go back to our case. Um, we have our uh, guy with moderately active RA, considering treatment with adalimumab. Uh, we have uh, all these options uh, on the table of multiple biosimilars uh, for adalimumab. Let's say theoretically they're all available to us right now, which uh, we know that they're not. You know, how are we going to work ourselves uh, through this process? Well, first I think we're going to ask ourselves, what are the evidence that supports that these are really highly similar and that there's no clinically meaningful differences? So here is kind of the punch list of the uh, analytics that John has just walked us through to compare adalimumab to its biosimilars and to prove to us that it's highly similar. As you can see, uh, we have all these uh, chemical uh, analytics, we have these immunologic analytics, all of them are uh, worked through in a detailed and rigorous process that at the end of the day have to tell us that there are no meaningful differences. Here's just one example. Here we're looking at PK in healthy subjects given uh, innovator and biosimilar adalimumab. And as you can see from this, it looks like you're looking at one graph. Uh, and certainly the error bars show that this is uh, virtually identical. Here we can demonstrate that a, another uh, biosimilar adalimumab, looking at its bioequivalency, again, this all looks like virtually uh, we're looking at the same molecule. The next slide shows efficacy data. And here, you know, we're talking about a relatively small study compared to the studies that uh, have to be put into place for an originator approval process. But here you have adalimumab and one of its biosimilars, AVP501. And as you can see, looking at these uh, ACR20 responses, quite uh, robustly similar. Here we're looking at uh, one additional uh, biosimilar adalimumab, BI695501, um, and the reference product. And again, we're looking at uh, ACR20 uh, responses. And uh, as you can see, they are quite similar uh, in magnitude. And you can actually look over at the toxicity profile table and demonstrate that there's very little meaningful difference between these. So if we take a look in two different disease states, rheumatoid arthritis and plaque psoriasis, at the ABP501, we can check the binding antibody positivity and the neutralizing antibody positivity. For these studies in these different populations, the height of the bars in both disease states is really not different. So this is um, the first foray into demonstrating evidence of highly biosimilar immunogenicity data. Here we're looking at the BI, adalimumab, ADBM uh, data for ADAs and anti-neutralizing antidrug antibodies uh, from baseline over different time points, uh, checking the BI molecule, Humira, approved in the U.S. and in Europe, which is an interesting little detail that you might want to remember that these kinds of uh, uh, different drugs uh, being approved in different agencies, um, the data may need to be demonstrated there. But all of the heights of these bars are very similar, and again, demonstrating that the immunogenicity is uh, very similar. So let me come back to you, John, and just say that I, I think that immunogenicity is one of the critical issues. It's easy for me to look at efficacy and safety in these small studies, but immunogenicity is of, of more concern because we know but by definition they are not identical, so there are subtle differences. The data you've shown are 
pretty reassuring for uh, what we've seen. But I'm going to wait until we discuss the switching to finally weigh in on the differences in immunogenicity. Because going back and forth, back and forth, uh, we know these are highly immunogenic molecules. And this is the area of greatest concern, at least to me personally. Uh, Len, I couldn't agree with you more. This back and forth switching, which we call interchangeability, is the crux of the matter. And we need to see that, that kind of data. And we're back to the case. So, um, again, the 50-year-old with uh, rheumatoid arthritis, treatment with adalimumab, the options are shown here. Now we have a 38-year-old with SPA. This woman uh, had inflammatory back pain, was on non-steroidals, uh, then developed uh, chest pain, which we know is so common in SPA. She has an active BASDI uh, 4.3. And after our shared and informed decision-making about a TNF inhibitor, she thinks that uh, infliximab, uh, branded Remicade uh, here, is a logical good choice for her. She uh, starts on the drug, uh, gets her infusions, and eight weeks later, BASDI is down to a, a low level. She's back to her activity in the dance world, but she's really concerned about the cost, and she's heard heard that a biosimilar may be more affordable on her current plan, and I would be asking her, show me the data on this, because uh, this is really what it's all about. Let's look at some options. So at the present time, uh, at least in terms of approved biosimilar infliximabs, there are two. There is Inflectra and Renflexis. They've had a, a different approval uh, timeline but they are all approved for uh, SPA, her indication. As you can see, the actual uh, approval indications are identical. Let's um, break this down and look at some additional data. Here we have a biosimilar, uh, CTP13, and the innovator, infliximab. And as you can see, looking at ACR responses, there is no meaningful differences in response rates of ACR20s to uh, these drugs. And again, this is another uh, piece of the puzzle that demonstrates no meaningful difference in efficacy. Here we have biosimilar SB2 and the innovator infliximab. So we're looking at another biosimilar, and we have the originator. And here is some data demonstrating more or less equivalent efficacy in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. As you can see, the uh, response rates in the uh, bar graphs uh, are virtually identical. And when we actually look at the ACR20 response, I think this is important because it shows the chronopharmacology showing that the onset of action is virtually identical uh, for these two drugs. So, again, another originator, several more biosimilars, uh, and these type of data have demonstrated no meaningful difference. Now let me show three different study designs that have attempted to tease out the issues of efficacy, safety, and immunogenicity in biosimilar drug development. The first is a transition study uh, where the patient population has started on biosimilar reference drug, and then the reference population is switched to a biosimilar. And we can take uh, some data away from that. The second is where uh, patients are started on either reference drug or biosimilar, and a portion of these patients are maintained on their original treatment selection, but then a third population is transitioned, so we have a different level of comparison. And then the final is the most vital and the most uh, complex, and uh, the design that actually is uh, uh, maybe uh, the greatest risks uh, for patients participating, and that is back and forth switching. And here we're showing mini switches. These are kind of iconic designs of trials that uh, we will be looking for to tease this data out. So, John, what do we actually know about the uh, data from switching studies? So let me just interject here also, uh, Len, that at the very bottom, that interchangeability concept, there is not so far proposed um, the idea of interchangeability switches between biosimilars. Everything so far has been a reference drug to the biosimilar back and forth. So if we go to the next slide, we can see the NORSWITCH study, which was a phase four 
non-inferiority study that was uh, undertaken by the Norwegian government. And it was a non-medical switch study. It was done for financial purposes to test out this theory. Patients with a variety of rheumatic uh, and um, inflammatory bowel disease disorders were uh, randomized to either stay on reference Remicade or be switched to biosimilar infliximab CTP-13. The data here that demonstrates for the, uh, uh, all the disease states on the left-hand column, um, infliximab originator versus the biosimilar, the risk reference difference um, against the standard of zero in the, uh, in the middle of this graph you see that if the data and the endpoints um, are to the left of the vertical line, it favors the uh, originator infliximab, and to the right, it favors the biosimilar. All of these disease states, they really demonstrated no difference. There's one exception which I uh, asked to be outlined um, in blue, and that's the Crohn's disease one, where there's really not a crossover of zero, and so there's a question of, is this a standout? I do want to point out, though, that this study was not powered to demonstrate individual differences or analyses for the different disease states, and consequently, uh, one can only take away from the sub-analysis uh, looking at here that there may be some uh, question in the Crohn's disease population that needs to be explored more thoroughly regarding the switching. As far as immunogenicity, there really appeared to be uh, no particular uh, difference between the originator and the biosimilar. And here we're seeing a transition to a biosimilar with uh, infliximab SB2. The mean DAS score uh, between the two uh, lines here looks like it's completely overlapping. Um, if you stand back a little bit or take your reading glasses off like I can, everything becomes a big unitary blur in terms of, uh, of efficacy with the uh, drop DOS in this uh, transition study. And as far as uh, safety is concerned in this uh, rather large table, if you go down the um, infliximab to SB2 transition, the infliximab to infliximab, that's a reference uh, population that stays on infliximab originator, where SB2 to SB2 stays on the biosimilar from the beginning. If you look in the parentheses outlined in the red box, there's really no obvious difference in terms of overall anti-drug antibody amounts, and uh, all of the adverse events listed in the table are about the same in, in terms of frequency. If we examine this case, here is an example of a person responding to an originator drug. Uh, and the data we've seen thus far have demonstrated that the biosimilars uh, to the originator have equal efficacy and equal toxicity, or the words that we use are highly similar since it's really not equal or generic or identical. I think that uh, this is a case that, at least in, in my mind, uh, the data are quite reassuring that a switch would not lose efficacy nor pose unreasonable safety to the patient. So this is a patient with a spondyloarthritis condition who starts Remicade at 5 mg per kg, the standard dose. Within three months, she is not feeling better. So the rheumatologist in this case opts to check serum levels, not a common practice by rheumatologists. We know that our GI colleagues are in the habit of doing this. Uh, but in this case, the rheumatologist uh, decided to do so and found that the infliximab trough level was low, but the anti-drug antibody level was high. So here are some very important salient points to know. The anti-infliximab antibodies of Remicade-treated patients will cross-react with the biosimilar infliximab. This is true for either the Remsema product or Inflectra product. In essence, antibodies to Remicade will similarly neutralize TNF binding of either biosimilar to TNF, and antibody-positive patients treated with Remicade should not be switched for this reason to an infliximab biosimilar because of this cross-reactivity process. So let me add another case. This is a 54-year-old woman with psoriatic arthritis, PSA. 16 weeks ago, she had 
rather mild skin, but she had uh, dactylitis, as you can see there, early morning stiffness. She started branded infliximab, Remicade, plus methotrexate. And now today, four months later, she's really no better. So I would call this a primary failure. It's actually, you know, not much different than the uh, case before, but we have no drug levels and we have no immunogenicity uh, studies. John, so this is, uh, uh, you know, a primary failure to a TNF agent. And like uh, most of the time, uh, as, and as you pointed out, rheumatologists and dermatologists don't use uh, drug levels and anti-drug antibodies as much as our GI colleagues. So, I mean, what, how do you think about this patient? Well, I think we've got, um, as you said, a primary infliximab TNF failure, and going to a biosimilar of, of that would be not very reasonable in my mind. Going to another TNF, I mean, there's a possibility there'll be a response. Uh, we tend to think that primary TNF failures uh, are very tough patients to give a different TNF to. So uh, one would have to decide whether to take that pathway or perhaps a different mechanism of action. I agree completely. So uh, here we are, primary failure, PSA, and considering a switch to a Tanercept. You know, some insurance companies want you to fail two TNF inhibitors. So now the question is, uh, she's failed originator in Fliximab, and you decided on a Tanercept. So would you choose the branded Tanercept Enbro or RLZ, an approved biosimilar uh, Tanercept? I think that this uh, poses some interesting issues. And again, I will interject as uh, before we go on, I would like to know who will stand to benefit in terms of financial gain in making this choice. And uh, these will be uh, ongoing and robust and dynamic issues uh, for all of our patients moving forward. Let me summarize some interesting data on equivalency and the similarity data for etanercept and its biosimilars. So here we can see GP2015 and etanercept biosimilar. And again, looking at this uh, PK curve, you can see that it is virtually identical. I'd like to spend a minute talking about the EGALITY study uh, because I think that this is one of the more important studies that have been done in biosimilars to date. Uh, here you can see a study design. So this is a plaque psoriasis, not psoriatic arthritis. And the design of the study was to compare etanercept to a biosimilar, GP2015 biosimilar, to the point of 12 weeks. And at that time, the primary endpoint was efficacy. Then it starts to get interesting, and if you follow the red and the blue lines, you can see that some patients stay on uh, the branded product through the next six weeks and then beyond, uh, but another transition to the opposite drug. So the originator goes to the biosimilar, biosimilar goes to the originator. And then at week 18, after six weeks, there is another switch and the logical uh, opposite uh, drug is chosen again. And then at week 24, the final switch, which then is followed out to 52 weeks, the 52-week data is primarily uh, safety, including immunogenicity. If we look at the treatment response at 12 weeks, I think by this point in the presentation, you should not be surprised that the responses are virtually identical. And here uh, we're looking at the response of uh, the plaque psoriasis, and I think that there's no way to conclude other that these are uh, anything but uh, highly similar. The more important thing, because this is really the first study that uh, I had seen uh, that actually contains uh, multiple switches in it, it shows that there were no differences between any treatment emergent adverse event, any serious adverse event, or any discontinuation. And uh, throughout the more details of the paper, this was a, quite a, a reassuring investigation. So let's uh, talk about some additional considerations with biosimilars. I had alluded to this before, that interchangeability is an FDA designation, and it requires different data standards than biosimilarity alone. And it requires a dedicated switching study that Len just uh, showed to you, uh, both in terms of design and proposed uh, protocol, uh, as well as the actual evidence uh, from the last study. And then also there's a, a, an important requirement for post-marketing monitoring. 
a product that has been approved to be interchangeable may be substituted without intervention of the prescribing provider, but the key word here is may, because substitution is a state pharmacy board determination, and so every state has their own set of laws regarding this. Um, And so one needs to understand what their state's law is relating to the idea of um, a pharmacist being able to substitute. And the concept here is that any biologic product under consideration for substitution presumably has to first be approved by FDA as interchangeable. And by and large, um, virtually all states that I have seen or have heard of that have uh, adopted uh, um, their state laws regarding biosimilars and substitution include this must. The FDA has to include in the label of the biosimilar the term interchangeable. And then there are some additional considerations that come up with biosimilars, and these would apply to whether or not you are a physician in a practice that may be buying and billing for um, the delivery of a biosimilar or a hospital or an infusion center and or for even a sub-Q injectable uh, biosimilars. Uh, there's this issue of inventory and tracking. Imagine you have Remicade and then you have two other approved biosimilars more perhaps on the way, and this will be multiplied by the number of biologics out there over time. There's going to be the pricing issue. So Medicare has a reimbursement pricing model, which, as you see here, ASP of the biosimilar averages plus 6% of the ASP of the reference product. But as each biosimilar may come on the market and as they price compete over time, these prices may wildly vary and can pose some problems for the timing of buying versus the timing of getting paid for because of the variability of the reimbursements. Who's going to feel the savings with biosimilars? Presumably, and hopefully it will be the patients, but there are a lot of other players in the getting the drug to market from the manufacturer and then through the distribution change, and um, I certainly have concerns about some of these savings being siphoned off by middlemen, uh, if you will. And then there's this issue of, well, we, we have all of our reference biologics on the market, so all the companies afford a variety of, um, of support programs for both the patients and the prescribers and offices and such. Um, is that going to be true of the biosimilar companies? And then there also is uh, the um, very real, present, ongoing issue of legal challenges to patents and other strategies that are used by originator companies to prevent competition from biosimilar companies. And, and, and watch this, because this will be delaying the advent um, and the availability of biosimilars on the market. So a lot of key messages here. A, biosimilars are not generics. They have to demonstrate that they have the same efficacy and safety profile as the reference product. Uh, In the approved indications, extrapolation is justified upon the totality of evidence. If a patient is doing well in a reference product, data from switching studies suggest that similar efficacy and safety can be expected. However, we have to note that the ACR and other societies are advocating that it is not a good idea that a patient is switched from a, um, a reference product that they're doing well on to a biosimilar strictly for monetary issues. Um, this is a great debate. Patients who develop anti-drug antibodies to a given biologic should not be switched from another version of the same biologic, originator or biosimilar. Uh, but I would add to that, assuming that the, there has been a clinical problem because of those anti-drug antibodies, that's not always the case. So certainly in efficacy, secondary loss of efficacy, or uh, some safety issue, this concept would hold. And then the availability of biosimilars has the potential to broaden the access of biologic therapies to patients and for for rheumatologic conditions and to provide cost savings. So better access, more patients uh, being able to be treated.